Could you please pronounce your name correctly for me? Joanna Zano, in French, that is. Now, the first thing that I poked in my mind when I looked at you, why did you move from France to Norway? Yeah, good question, which I get asked a lot. So I was working in Paris as an archivist, a corporate archivist for Galerie Lafayette. And I was looking for a change of scenery. So I applied to a PhD at the University of Oslo. And so I applied, I got it, and I came. So that was simply, you know, what happened. And then I decided to stay. Take a step back. Childhood always fascinates me. How did you get made? So like, were your parents creative? Like, how did you get your find yourself leading down the path of this creative field? Yeah, so I come from a family that is completely outside of the cultural world. So both of my families were in agriculture, kind of very poor farmers, not really the super rich farmers with a lot of properties and, you know, and they both came from immigration. So my father's family come from Italy and my mother's family from Belgium. And they settled in the, the southwest of France, where I was born. And both of my families were in this farming slash working class background. So there wasn't a lot of cultural activities going around when I was a child. That being said, my mom brought us to museums, but it was more natural history museums or, you know, zoology, which was really fascinating and made a huge impression on me. So in spite of the fact that they were not from educated backgrounds, we got access to museums. And then I had a lot of after-class activities like pottery or painting or all sorts of creative activities. So that was a lot of fun. But I think I was also good at school and I really enjoyed school. And I actually got to develop my creativity through school, especially through French literature. That, that's very funny. Uh, generally, people say that school sort of beats people's creativity out of them, not puts it in, into them. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends the kind of students you are and the kind of teachers you get. It's really a matter of encounters and people more than actually systemic <laughs> education. Yeah, education systems. Absolutely. Yeah. So I got a lot of, I mean, especially writing tasks at school were particularly, yeah, I, I learned a lot and I learned how to progressively build my own voice. So that was, yeah, school was part of it. All right. And now you're currently an independent curator. Is that correct? Yes. Among other things, I am an independent curator. Absolutely. Well, the, the other things also are interesting as well. So like you know, one of my big pet peeves about the way the arts is either supported, not supported, appreciated, not appreciated, is is that most of us end up having to work multiple jobs to make our lives uh, comfortable, whatever that means for each of us. So what else do you have to do these days? Right. So because I still have a foot in the academic world, I'm guest editing a journal and this is entirely free work, so it's actually not sustaining myself at all. It's just keeping the door open to stay in academia. I'm leading two curatorial projects at the moment. And then in addition to that, I have a full-time position as a mediation specialist at the Norwegian Association for Arts and Craft. Well, please tell me more about the Norwegian Association for Arts and Crafts. I said that slowly because I wanted to make sure I said it correctly. Yeah, it's correct. Yeah, Norway is organized with its artists' associations, which were organized originally by medium. So you have the Arts and Crafts Organization, you have the Visual Arts Association, Sculpture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Wait, why is Sculpture and Visual Arts separated? Oh, well, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that seems weird. Yeah. Each specialty has its own association. And for instance, there is also a textile association, which is separate from the arts and crafts. So it's also, yeah, it's fragmented in different associations. I would imagine with your interests, though, the textile would be sort of up your alley. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my background is in fashion history, not textile per se. So it's it's always, I mean, there are intersections, but it's also pretty different. I feel kind of at home in the Arts and Crafts Association as well. I studied a history of decorative arts, as it was called in France. And I also organize like small scale exhibitions of crafts and design in France. So it's sort of continuity. All right. So given that you have a sort of an interest and a background in fashion slash art, how does that sort of come together in your mind? So you have like a certain types of scholars and curators who try to legitimize fashion by saying that fashion is a form of art. And this is not something that I'm really interested in. Fashion is first and foremost an industry and a commercial system with a sector and businesses and a lot of different yeah, organizational rules, etc. And the way I see art is art gives us or gives me the possibility to comment upon the fashion system. So I'm really interested in putting together art and fashion and see how they can inform each other. But it's not about saying that both worlds are overlapping in a sense. Interesting, because when I was looking at you ahead of time, I was thinking about how pushing limits, pushing boundaries, you know, like couture work is to me a, a, a sense of an art form in and of itself. So basically like pushing the limits of fashion is in and of itself an art form. But that's not what you're saying. Well, it's where I started, actually. So when I did my master thesis, I started with actually looking at one haute couture house in Paris, which was called Jean Patou. And I looked at the house and I was really interested in the artistic side of the business and showing how the dresses and the garments which were produced could actually be considered as a form of art and whether the label on clothing could be considered a sort of artistic signature for instance. So that was the beginning of the journey, in a sense. But then I really progressively became way more interested in the business history aspects, um, which I think is deeply fascinating. And so my PhD was more of a business history PhD. I looked at the revival of fashion brands, and I looked at how, basically, brands, which used to be very famous, died and then were reopened by big luxury players. And when they reopened the brand, obviously they tried to echo the collections from the past. And there is like a sort of artistic visual identity that is built by the brand. But what was more interesting to me in a sense, or equally interesting, was the business historical aspect of it and the marketing strategies that are developed by these brands. So I went from Art history was an MA in art history to a PG in history, more business history. And then I went into contemporary art. So that's maybe a strange journey that I took. It is quite a journey. So now you're focused more on art than fashion. That's actually a tricky question for me. I would say that I still, I'm really in between at the moment. So my two curatorial projects take fashion as a departure point, but are presented in contemporary art environments. Don't get me wrong. I'm not judging you at all. I mean, for me, I'm a photographer. So of course my background, fashion it plays a huge element in photography for sure. I mean, I'm whenever I teach, I'm always having to tell people like, please make sure that somebody's not wearing a big graphic T with a logo on it because that becomes very distracting visually in the image away from being able to engage in the emotional content of the worker, et cetera, et cetera, kind of thing. So fashion for me is a very important part of creating, well, creating artwork, but even within the arts world, it's also very important because a lot of artists extend their sort of brand or their personality through the way they express themselves with their clothing. So like I can think of many people throughout my lifetime that like artists that I knew that dressed in some very unique way that like when they walked in a room, oh, you know who that is kind of thing. So I mean, 
even if it's not necessarily the thing that's in the gallery, it still plays a huge role in the creative industries. Absolutely. And I mean, fashion is something that is part of everybody's life, whether we want it or not. And you can also use it to look at different scales. It's the intimate, it's close to your body, but at the same time, it's also part of social interactions and it's also a big economy at a global scale. So you really have all these layers of fashion, which are very interesting and can be unpacked in different ways, be it research or contemporary art. So absolutely. I'm a huge fan of good fashion. I mean, I one of my favorite things to do in the recent years was actually go to cost getting bespoke clothing made for myself. Unfortunately, my weight fluctuates horribly, so I can't really do, you know, it would be stupid for me to buy custom stuff because I might not fit it in a year or two. But so what role do you see fashion in the art sphere at this point? I think fashion is a bit of an outsider and fashion isn't always welcome in the art gallery. I mean, when applying to grants, for instance, it's very clear that fashion is at the margins of what people are interested in, in the public grant system. However, I still find very interesting collaborators, both galleries and artists. So fashion has definitely its place, but it's not necessarily an obvious one. And it is something that I have to work with. And this is also what I find interesting about it. It is interesting. I mean, I grew up in a household where fashion was reasonably admired. We actually had mannequins in our house with like ethnic things from like Romania and different historical docu uh, things like some kimonos and stuff like this on display as sculptural artistic pieces in my household. So we are sort of preaching to the choir. So I'm sort of surprised that other people are not as supportive and or willing to like fund and participate in these kinds of ideas. Yeah, I think it depends what you associate it with. Clearly, you associate it with a heritage side of fashion, like historical pieces, pieces from different places bespoke fashion but i guess the association that most people have with fashion is fast fashion it's h&m and zara and that's the commercial side of it is a hindrance this is how i i perceive it maybe i'm wrong <laughs> oh, we're all wrong on many things but no fast fashion to me is the death of fashion like that's not fashion that's just following trends and trying to make money that's all that fast fashion is, or setting trends and trying to make money. But it's always about trying to make money. But that's all what fashion is anyway. Fashion is about money. Is it really? Fashion is an industry. I mean, you have obviously independent fashion designers who try to make a living and not become the biggest capitalists ever. But fashion is a business. I'm aware it is a business, but I, would, I guess I'm maybe a bit... Uh... I don't know, utopian, um, that's not right, the bit optimistic <laughs> that I would like to think it's not a business. I would like to think it's for the purpose of the work. Like I have a friend of mine who does her own fashion line and she hand dyes all of her fabrics, hand cuts everything. Everything's in low run, possibly even you know bespoke for individual people kind of stuff. So like, I'm a huge fan of that, of supporting that kind of work more so than going to H&M or Zara. Boy, I'm never going to get those, them as advertisers, am I? But <laughs> I'm not a fan of that stuff. I, I would rather spend a little bit more money for something handmade or custom made or even just like something where you can tell that there's a little bit more creativity or elegance or craftsmanship put into the thing than than just some fast thing that only lasts a season yeah um you have all sorts of fashion producers and fashion consumers and definitely a the trend toward more sustainable fashion would be to invest in quality and invest in pieces which are well-made, made ethically, where you can have control over the production chain, etc. But this is a marginal part of the fashion system. It's not what people actually wear on a daily basis, which is still mass-produced, 
outsourced in different parts of the world where the workforce is really cheapest. So at the moment, it's Ethiopia, for instance. Last time I looked at it, I think it was Turkey was the cheapest. Yeah, that, but yeah. that was like 10, 10, 12 years ago. It was, it was Turkey was the place they were doing all that. Yeah, it changes really fast. So it used to be Cambodia, Cambodia and Sri Lanka. But then Hana Plaza happened and a lot of international attention got into Southeast Asia. And then brands shifted production to Africa, East Africa. So the fashion system has really an uncanny ability to, you know, continue exploitative practices by changing places. You know, it's so sad. It is. It's really, really sad. And it's part of it. And this is also what's interesting by looking at fashion is that you really look at global exchanges and you look at different situations all over the world, even though you're situated in Oslo, Norway, for instance. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I try to buy, if not locally, at least regionally for most things, if I can. Like uh, recently I was just at a design market and there was this lady who had a booth and she, she had a bunch of things. She said, oh, these are you know my designs, blah, blah, blah. And, but yet the label said that they were made in another country much like you're talking about you know with low wages kind of thing and i was sort of like yeah it's not really made by you it's designed by you but then you have outsourced it somewhere and I, there, there's a bit of craftsmanshipy kind of thing that i like to me i i don't uh, i don't put that as like made by them i know i'm being a snob but that's just sort of my go my perspective on it yeah, I mean, but even if they were to produce locally, do they know where the fibers were made? Not necessarily. It's a very difficult problem. I mean, every time you try to improve one aspect of your production chain, you don't know what are the repercussions for all the other elements. I mean, fashion designers who are trained at the moment, so the next generation of fashion designers, they really feel it's hopeless for them to get into the fashion industry. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I say that with a smiley face, but <laughs> another sad state of affairs. All right, let's try and turn this around. Let's be a little happier, more positive. So, right. as a curator working in art galleries, trying to include fashion, so how how do you like? Give me a mental picture of how you manifest uh, marrying art in a gallery setting with fashion. Right. So I did this exhibition for. Ram Gallery in Oslo. And the idea was to combine art with fashion by inviting four artists and four fashion designers and asking them each to, actually, I didn't ask them to produce a piece, but I chose already existing pieces that they had made. And I confronted the objects at the same level in the exhibition space. And I used a narrative thread, which was from French poem from the 19th century to sort of weave a path between the different objects and create an overall narrative. And so basically the meeting between the different objects happened by itself in the gallery setting. And again, I didn't try to pass fashion design as artworks, but I thought that what was interesting, it was the way they answered each other or echoed each other in the gallery setting. Why couldn't you pass the fashion office artworks? Yeah, I mean, you can argue that by putting it in a gallery, it becomes art anyway. Definitely. It's out of its context. But I was still trying to make a comment about the fashion industry when talking with the fashion designers. So I guess the intent behind it makes it a bit different. It does. Now, okay, so things I love about curators, by the way, love curators. <laughs> How do you do this? Like, so how do you put together an exhibition? Like, it, were you, are you approached? Do people come to you and say, "Hey, I'd really love it if you'd curate something," and then you come up with an idea, or do you come up with an idea and then find, try and find the artist, and then try and find a location for it, and then try and find funding for it? Like, how you know, what's the job that you're sort of having to work to to pull these kinds of things off? Well, it's something that I'm trying to figure out myself. So coming from academia, I'm cracking you up. 
I laugh all the time. I, I love the fact that I get to ask the most absurd questions to people. <laughs> like, so like, this is my job. I get just get to ask, like, so how the fuck do you do this? <laughs> you, could be, yeah. you know, I try and do it in an eloquent manner, but basically I just get to be like, so you really, you do this really cool thing. How the fuck do you pull that off? That's fun. So how did I do it? <laughs> so, I mean, I came from academia, so I knew I wanted to do an exhibition, but I had no clue how to do it. So I just did it. <laughs> so what I did is that I came up with an ID, which I wrote down into an exhibition proposal, and then I started sending it. And I sent it to everybody, everybody I could think of. So... I looked at, you know, museum website, galleries, open call for artists, etc. And by sending the proposal, I got to refine the exhibition ID more and more until it became good enough that somebody would read it. And that's how I, I got the exhibition at Ham Gallery. I answered their open call for artists. And it was actually not open for curators at all. But I decided, why not? I mean, what's the difference? At the end of the day, it's going to be an exhibition. <laughs> and so I sent my proposal and I was really, really surprised when they replied to me, actually. I never thought it was possible. And so starting from then, obviously, it was a conversation with the gallery between what I had imagined the exhibition could be and what type of exhibition they had made themselves why they were interested in the project, what specific aspects had caught their eye. And so we started this process of discussion, which lasted for actually quite a few months. So the exhibition had that, like the <laughs> most epic timeline ever. So the gallery almost went broke and then reopened. And then the project got accepted in a museum, but then the museum got broke. So I went back to the gallery. So <laughs> it has this like completely crazy timeline but obviously along the way the project got better or at least I like to hope so and it at least got more substantial and so I progressively built this proposal and I made lists of artists and I just you know I mean I had no clue so I googled random stuff to see what was coming up and I made lists and lists and lists of names. I saved pictures on my computer. I have, I don't know, maybe five giga of pictures for this exhibition, which I never could use, obviously. And progressively, I built kind of what I thought would be a unified proposal. And I presented it to the gallery. And then they said, yes, sure. And then I contacted people, artists and fashion designers, and then they said yes or no. <laughs> and then I had to adjust the artwork list. When people said no, I had obviously to find somebody else. But I had no clue. So I didn't know that you could ask artists to produce specifically for an exhibition, which is what contemporary art is about. I mean, this is like not knowing the obvious thing. It's completely crazy. So I went through their website and I built my exhibition with existing artworks, basically. And the gallery probably didn't know I didn't know. So nobody really had this conversation about how you actually do it in practice. <laughs> so it ended up being an exhibition of already existing artworks from 2014 to 2019, I think. So relatively recent works and nothing out of a museum vault, but still, it wasn't exactly your typical contemporary art exhibition, maybe. I don't think there's anything wrong with a contemporary art exhibition being work that's of somebody who's still living, you know, to some of their earlier work. That's perfectly acceptable. I know lots of artists that still exhibit stuff from 10, 15 years ago. But yeah, it is not normal. Usually the, the idea would be to commission new works. But the problem with that, well, I mean, what you did in my mind, now maybe I'm totally wrong on this, but in my mind, it's actually a very uh, sort of cost effective, speed effective, you know, so you, you don't have to wait for people to produce new things because these things already exist. You don't have to pay them to commission a new work because it's already been made. So like, it actually makes it so that putting on an exhibition, it has a much better potential for success because these things already exist 
they don't cost anything. So you probably could pull it off a lot easier, faster, and cheaper. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we still got issues with transport, for instance. So you can still find little problems at <laughs> at the last moment come on top of it. But obviously, yeah, it was super easy way to do it and super low key as well. What I did is that I wanted to present artists and fashion designers. So I came up with this idea of chance encounters between the different objects, which is inherited from surrealists. I guess it's quite famous. And then I realized that the surrealists had been also really inspired by Comte de Lauréamont and his poem. So I went to the book <laughs> and I read Comte de Lauréamont, which is something that every French pupil is supposed to have read this book, but somehow I just had a vague memory of it. And so I read this poem and it suddenly, you know, all the pieces started to fall together. And so the list of artists, which so far had only been sort of, maybe that could be interesting. I don't know why I'm interested in that, but that looks cool or that is interesting or that is a concept which I would like to explore. And suddenly all these separate elements started to form a narrative together. And so I had at the end both layers of chance encounters and following the poem in itself, echoing the poem. And that's how the exhibition came together in the end. That's how I made the choice. It was made in such a way that I could echo the texts and the text could shed light on the exhibited objects. But I mean, obviously this project, when I realized that I had missed the point of commission, I realized when I was asked by an art critic the day of the opening, he asked me why I didn't commission anything. And it's because I didn't know I could. So that was like the basis of my next project, basically, which is entirely commissioned. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I would not have assumed you could have, but in America, it's not as common to commission works for exhibitions like that. In Europe, it seems it's a much more common uh, habit to do that. Yeah, I mean, I would say like the vast majority of exhibitions that are showed in contemporary art galleries in, in Norway, but in Oslo particularly, it's commissioned work or it's newly created work that hasn't been shown before. Well, and Norway has this incredible luxurious lifestyle in that the arts and the culture of the region is incredibly financially supported in a way that it's not in other places in the world. So therefore, the idea of commissioning a work there has a little bit of legitimacy because these people, you know, I'm trying to think there are people that are getting like artist salaries or some sort of income from the government kind of thing basically to be producing. So it makes sense that the idea of doing it there, but not necessarily anywhere else in the world. Yeah, it's very context specific. And my knowledge so far is limited to the Norwegian context for exhibition making. So definitely everything I say only applies to Oslo mostly. <laughs> well, it seems like a great place to do it though. I mean, the amount of support that you all get is astounding in comparison to most of the world. Just to throw it out there. <laughs> well, there is nothing I can say against that. <laughs> well, yeah, I know you work for the association. You really shouldn't. But exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the, now, you say you came from academia. What was your role in academia and why did you choose to, I'm assuming you chose to leave. So why did you choose to leave? Yeah, so I really liked my research topic and I was really happy to to research it for a long time or for a long time. It's a normal time for research, but I spent three years on my PhD and an additional year of postdoc. So four years on the same topic. That's solely normal in academia. And I still liked the, the topic, the research questions, reading research literature, engaging with colleagues at conferences and everything. But what I really dislike, and I shouldn't be saying that publicly, but was the teaching. And <laughs> the entire system of academia wasn't really working for me. So I started to think of different ways of talking about fashion uh, that wasn't an academic paper or an academic course that I could teach to a bunch of students. 
at the University of Oslo, you know. Okay, I'm fascinated because I'm also a professor. So I'm fascinated by this because I hate the institutional nature of academia, not because of the teaching, love the teaching. If I could sit in a classroom 10 hours a day, I would be in heaven. I love doing that. I hate meetings and papers and meetings. <laughs> like they're just so annoying to me. Like, and, but the other thing that I ran into was in the last couple of places that I taught the, the, a lot of the administration was sort of what I call sort of sticking their hand nose in the, in the classroom. And they were sort of trying to dictate what we should teach, uh, you know, and I don't appreciate that very much. So like, if I could find, if I could find some amazing like university, that's a, that's just an art school and where the administration will just leave you alone and they just respect you and trust you enough to teach your thing, I would be an absolute heaven. Sadly, I know that doesn't exist, but so, <laughs> So what is it that you, so you didn't like teaching, but you liked what? Yeah, I mean, it's not a popular opinion and I'm aware of that. I chose this program, this PhD program, because I didn't have to teach while doing my PhD. So it comes from a prejudice that I have for a long time. And it's not linked to any experience of teaching. It's my perception of what teaching would entail, I would say. But then I got to teach and it wasn't as bad as I had imagined it would be, but it was still not so interesting to me. And I think it's there is a difference in the type of classes that one is teaching. And what I don't like is teaching content. Like I don't like to teach people stuff about, I, I taught history of consumption and it's a topic I'd like to read about, to research and to write about, but it's not in, in a classroom situation, I feel that I am supposed to have some sort of knowledge which I'm disseminating to students. And this is a very old pedagogic model, and this is not how things are today, where it's co-learning by the different people in seminar settings, etc. But the reality of it, I still feel like students expect me to have knowledge which they need to absorb, no matter how much you tell them it's not how it's supposed to be. And this is this position of hierarchy was really difficult for me. I really did disliked it. So, but when I taught, I taught like a class which was called Master Project Description, which is a very strange thing to call a class, if you ask me. But I thought it was really, really good because then it was about students finding their research topic and getting to progressively grasp what research actually is and what they are interested in and help them un understand that and make it into a better master thesis. And that was really, really cool. I enjoyed doing that a lot. And that's also called teaching. But it wasn't like giving three class about history of fashion, history of consumption, and history of something, like social history. I mean, no, I mean, seriously. I couldn't care less. I mean, it's terrible. I know, but <laughs> no, no. I, I will, I will back you up on that. If I had to just do history of anything, lectures, no, I would be miserable. Uh, I, I don't teach the. I teach studio classes generally, so it's very practice based and investigation based, and and sort of testing and trying and failing and learning from mistakes and so on and so on. So that's the kind of stuff I love teaching, much like you. But I think that, like to a certain extent, academia should allow for the variations of different kinds of teachers. Like I know. There was this one teacher, I'm not going to say his name, but there was this one teacher that I used to work with who was very, he loved writing papers and making dissertations and like doing all this great high intellectual academia bullshit. And he hated teaching. And I was just like, well, why don't we just like have different criteria of teachers? Some teachers are like 75% in the classroom, 25% meetings and papers and stuff like this. And then other teachers could be 75% papers and dissertations and all that, and only 25% in the classroom. Like why do quote unquote teachers need to be physically in a classroom? Because you can you can sort of pass on knowledge and information in different ways. Some people do have a stronger interest in the one 
style and other people have a stronger interest in the other because i sat in on that that particular teacher who had no interest in teaching and loved doing his dissertations and he is a horrible teacher in a classroom like he just he i was bored and i liked his topic and i was bored that was probably so, me as a teacher you know what you're describing here <laughs> Well, I, I don't understand why academia is so rigorous that like we all have to like they constantly tell us as professors like every student learns differently so be sure to you know do different teaching methods for different students needs on how to learn well but we as teachers teach differently so why don't they let us be like have as much variety as the people learning that's my soapbox for the day that's it yeah mm. Yeah, I mean, bureaucracy applied to academia is no good. So I don't know. I think it's a combin for me, it was a combination of things like the structure of academia, which forced me to teach when I didn't want to, the type of classes which I had to teach, although the history of is actually the field. So it's not about, you know, it's like you can investigate research, obviously. Well, just to be clear, as a PhD student, you were given the shit classes to teach. Like they, they gave you the classes that basically no other teacher wanted to teach. That's what no. they do. No, really? they didn't. I mean, this is the thing. I could choose what I was going to teach, even as a first timer teacher. So I devised my own class. I taught fashion and politics, and I taught the history of consumption. So it was not even about that. It was just, I didn't like this position of teacher-student, which was constricted. And I also selfishly didn't think I was gaining anything out of it. I mean, this was not, <laughs> like I was telling them stuff I already knew and they were not coming up with challenges for me, which I could take on. So it felt like I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't benefiting from it. <laughs> I am totally on your side. I have had this debate with an old friend of mine, Paige from Washington, DC. I used to keep, keep telling her, I was like, if I'm not interested in teaching this thing, then the students aren't going to be interested. So like, if I'm not having fun, if I'm not learning or seeing something new or, or gaining something from this experience, then I don't want to do it. Like it's boring. And she's like, no, your role is to pass on the knowledge of the generations before to the next generation. And I'm like, but that's boring. That's yeah. boring for me. And if I'm bored, I'm going to project boredom and then they're going to be bored. Yeah. I mean, boredom and contempt, I would argue, like it's not very good for the students to consider that I can't bring you anything. I mean, it's like, I don't think I have a lot of self-confidence, but I don't think it would be nice if, you know, they knew how I felt about it. <laughs> I have too much self-confidence, so that's not my problem. Oh, wow. Maybe you want to share a little. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it comes off oftentimes as arrogance, which is not intentional, but it's sort of a byproduct that it's a very fine line between self-confidence and arrogance. Yeah, I guess. Although, seen from my perspective, it all sounds very good. <laughs> it, it's funny. Where, where did I get that from? I probably got that from my father, who's a priest. And so he, every Sunday, he would have to stand up and give a sermon. And he did this for 30 years. And he said the same sermons <laughs> over and over and over. I mean, not the same. He would always, he would never repeat himself, but his topics were always the same. Because, I mean, it always was based in, the Bible, like there are only so many topics in the Bible. So, you know, when I, as a teacher went in, I always had to try and find a new way, like, cause one of the things that I don't love about academia also on top of all the other things is the fact that it's like, once you find a, a model that works, so like, so you got a class structure and you're like this and this and this, and, and you get good students and the good students produce good work. Then the academic structure expects you to just stay with that model and just keep teaching the same thing kind of for the rest of your career. And it's like, well, but, but that's not interesting. That's not exciting. That's not keeping up with the times. That's not using new technologies. That's not using new advancements or new research that's even being done that you could in integrate into it. Like I I'm for always sort of pushing it forward and keeping it, keeping it fresh and interesting, 
but that's not what academia wants us to do. Yeah. I mean, it depends on institutes, I guess, because like, I guess at, at my department, people were encouraged to change classes at maximum every four years. So, I mean, it's still a long period of time, but you, you're not expected to do it more than that. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're teaching four, four years, three semesters a year, that's t teaching one class 12 times yeah, it's awful. before you change it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'm complaining about academia, but I never got any of this. <laughs> I mean, I taught different classes each time and I got to decide what I was teaching and I got to decide the methods. And even then I didn't like it. <laughs> Fair enough. Academia is not for you. Got it. So research still is. And I think this is kind of, I mean, even though it's self-exploitation on my part, I still think it's really good to be able to combine research and curation in some ways. So. See, I would just say automatically, if somebody said there is a curator, I would assume there's an amount of research in there. I don't see that. Like to me, a researcher is a separate field slash career almost. But what, I mean, I guess the only places in my mind, keep in mind, wise fool, kind of stupid. In my mind, the places that you can do research are either institutions or institutions of higher learning. So schools or museums or Kunsthals or whatever kind of places. But how else do you do research outside of those sort of formal institutional ideas? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right to an extent, but I also think that due to the precarity of academic labor today, you have a lot of people who gravitate in this middle positions, half out, half in. And that means that there is a possibility for the people who are out of it <laughs> to actually still contribute. So, for instance, I could organize a research conference at a university while not be employed at that university. What that entails is that I did it for free, but I still got invited as a researcher to do it and to lead the content, select the abstracts, and then develop a special issue for a peer-reviewed journal. So my audience, when I write research or present research, is other researchers, in a sense, even though as you said, there is also a fair amount of research involved in exhibition making or other curatorial projects, obviously. But research for me is to address a certain type of audience and in a certain type of context. So mostly peer-reviewed publications and other researchers. Okay, so what's your career goal? The reason why I'm asking this, by the way, it, it, you're young. You're substantially younger than me. So, so I'm sort of just saying this because it seems like you're still a little bit in your foundational progress of sort of building into what will be your career, per se, like whatever that quote unquote career will be kind of thing. So like, so you're, you're putting these sort of dots together and you're combining things. What is it that you're trying to achieve with all of this? What's the career high point that you hope for? I mean, this is a question that, you know, people have to answer every job interview and every time you apply for something. And this is something I never had an answer for. Let me get really clear. Like, I mean, pie in the sky, money's no object, uh, you know, and no, no, there's no barriers in between you and being able to achieve this goal. What's that goal? Yeah, I still don't have an answer. I mean, this is an interesting thing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. That's my pie in the sky goal. That's I mine. know. I read about it. <laughs> and I I wish you luck. <laughs> Thank you. Working on it. <laughs> Definitely. Please invite me to the opening. <laughs> mm -hmm. I still can't answer you though. I mean, I'm young, yet I have already changed field from history to contemporary art. And each time I have jumped from one field to the next or from one project to the next, it was because I had opportunities to do so. And I think this is pretty much how I see myself as just, you know, doing stuff that are interesting to me, no matter what the context is and not limiting myself in terms of context. But I 
don't have any sort of long term planning, I don't see my, myself as holding a specific position or doing something in particular. But I mean, that being said, right now, what I would like to do is to do more exhibitions. So. Don't get me wrong. The reason why I'm asking that is because my assumption, and maybe I'm wrong on this, is, is that independent curators, and I put that in quotes, is a job that people do with the expectation to build up enough of a reputation to be able to then work at an institution as a curator. Like I, in my mind, which of course, you know, horribly outdated and old thought pattern, I'm sure, is that in independent curators are basically curators who haven't gotten a job opportunity at an institution yet. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I think I come from the opposite angle. So while I was doing my master thesis, I was also trained as a heritage curator in French. And I had the opportunity to stay in the museum world, which I thought was I don't know, it terrified me. Like I thought it was really constraining and I couldn't really fathom the idea of having a secure job position, which is like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what did I just say? I mean, I don't really wish to work, to work for an institution. I like the possibility of being an independent curator, but obviously there is a limit to that and it's money and having enough project to sustain oneself. So obviously it's a work in progress and like many others, I don't really have a solution yet. But as long as I can sustain myself, I would like to remain an independent curator. Okay. On that line, you also have a title on your website. So you have Art Concierge, which I love that title. It's a beautiful title. Has anybody ever used that? Is that yours? Do you have it like trademarked or anything? <laughs> I should. So basically, the title was created by the hotel who hired me and it existed in Paris before so it's supposedly Philip Stark who came up with this idea of art concierge for a palace in Paris for which he did the decoration so there was one art concierge in Paris and then the hotel for which I worked decided to have the same position in Oslo and the idea was that obviously the brand identity of the hotel is linked to art and they wanted to have an in-house person to create projects related to art. So they created this position, which is a mix of the traditional luxury concierge, which is all about service and fulfilling requests from the daily life to the extraordinary, complex and crazy requests of rich people, right? And the position of a of a more of an art curator, basically. So it's at the intersection of hospitality and contemporary art. Oh, I used to be a personal shopper at Banana Republic. So like I know all about the uh, having to please the customer kind of stuff in that high endy kind of idea. But there's been a little bit of a pause on it because of COVID. It's a natural thing, of course. But so when it comes back in and you start doing it again, the world opens up again. What will you be doing? So curating exhibitions or are you just putting things in the lobby? Are you putting artwork in the rooms to create sort of curated room experiences? Like, I mean, I find it personally quite fascinating. Yeah. So because the position isn't really a typical position, I also have some freedom in deciding what I want to do with it. And what was good about it is also that I got freedom from the hotel director. So I could decide what I wanted to do. And my position was like different things. So one of it was to create like an art menu of like, you know, exhibitions and events that people could attend. So it's a very basic tourist guide in a sense. It's like I selected shows which I liked best for the customers. So that was part of the job, like the service oriented part of the job. And another part was to do guided tour of the permanent collection. So the hotel has a permanent collection, which has been curated by Sune Norgren, a Swedish curator. And all the artworks have a link to Edvard Munch, because the hotel is <laughs> one of the sponsors of the Munch Museum and also gets a loan of an original artwork of Munch in the lobby. So there is an original monk in the lobby and there is a collection 
of contemporary artworks, which in some ways hint to Munch. So I was doing guided tours and I was also responsible for holding the dialogue with the museum as well. And the third part of the job was to actually curate a program of events. And so each month I organized lectures, film screenings and performances. And I was planning on starting with small scale exhibitions, but obviously Corona came and now it has been halted. But that's the plan. I mean, in the future, I would like more to develop yeah, an exhibitionary practice in the hotel. To me, that doesn't necessarily mean in the rooms themselves. I mean, so far, all the artworks are in the public spaces of the hotel. And the idea is more is that it's visible for both customers and bypasses. Yeah, I mean, you have many art hotels who have art in the rooms, but then you need to book a room and it's very limited in its use. So that's not really the idea here. You neglected to say the hotel's name, by the way. Clarion Hotel Oslo. <laughs> Got to do a little publicity for him. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I also had like a, a theory group at the hotel. So that was fun. I'm sorry, a what? <laughs> a theory group. <laughs> so the Clarion Hotel Oslo theory group, <laughs> which was meeting every other week. And we were discussing different theories based on hotel theory, the book by Wayne Kostenbaum. So it's a book, yeah, which was published in 2008, I think. And the idea is that you check in hotels as you check in with theories. You go in, have a look, and then go out and visit a certain numbers of theories. So that was the idea behind it. And what other projects do you have working on now? I'm currently working on a project called Critical Fashion Walk developing a series of walks in the city and engaging with the history of fashion in Oslo, or actually Oslo fashion past and present, through a series of interventions. And so we just had a pilot walk and it worked really well. So it was a little over two hours and it was, yeah, I don't know what I can say without saying too much about it, but it was the idea is to take a series of concepts and to explore them, to have a different, to cast a different eye on, on fashion. So it's like art in the public space, I guess you can call it. So from the on start, I wanted to have a project in the public space, but I didn't want it to be a guided tour. So I was trying to see how I could use a walk as a curatorial tool that wasn't a guided tour. And the starting point was really a, a sort of rejection of the guided tour. And then I got to organize a series of webinars on what is critical fashion, what is critical walk, and how to link the two perspectives in a series of, of walks. And so the idea is really that the walks work a bit like a quilt. So you have different patches of the city. And by walking through it, you're actually sewing together the different parts of the city. And what is really interesting about the quilting metaphor is that there is no center and margins in a quilt. It's, it's more of a decentered vision. And so the walk similarly isn't really going from one point to the next in the sense of having a, a narrative thread, but it's more accumulating meaning throughout the walk, through these different interventions. So that's really what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to quilt the city. But now paint me a picture. So let's say I'm a participant. I'm going to come and participate in this walk. What should I be expecting to do slash to see? Because you just said it's not a guided tour and it's about fashion and it's about public art. What am I going to experience? What you're going to do is that you're going to experience fashion production, consumption, and distribution through a set of locations that might not be evident. So it's not exactly the main or the most famous shop that you're going to see or, or, you know, this type of landmarks, historical landmarks. But you're going to see a different 
aspects of fashion labor, where people used to work in Oslo, how who they were, how they used to to be. Um, you're going to put on uh, coats that makes you reflect about who you are as a consumer of fashion. What type of consumer are you? A therapy shopper? Are you a compulsive buyer? Etc. <laughs> You, you should definitely try this on. <laughs> yeah, th therapy shopper for sure. Yeah. Mm, I guess me too, to some extent. Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm also a functional shopper as well, but generally therapy would be mine, yes. And yeah, you're going to talk about aesthetic labor in fashion retail, for instance, and what does it entail? Or where are the places where you buy fabric in Oslo and what for? And what is the divide between buying the raw product and making it and also marketing it. Each walk is actually very diverse in terms of concepts and places. So it's not really as if each walk has a particular theme, but each of the walk takes you through the whole production chain in a sense. So you get to reflect on different aspects. Okay, I'm going to be an absolute idiot and I'm going to ask you, it, is there a rich history of fashion in Oslo? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, what kind of fashion? I mean, like to me, being a foreigner, I would just say Scandinavian. <laughs> but I'm sure there's something much more specific than that. So like what's the sort of iconic industry that's uh, unique uh, to that region? Yeah. I think what comes to mind is the knitting industry but it's usually considered to be separate from the fashion industry. But definitely knitting is very specific to, to Scandinavia and to Norway in particular. But what is interesting is that, like, as you say, I mean, Oslo isn't really considered part of the fashion landscape in a sense. And traditionally, you have a, an image of the fashion system, which is with a center made of fashion capitals like Paris, London, New York and Milan and a few other fashion cities, international fashion cities, like Antwerp or Tokyo or maybe Stockholm even. And you have all the different urban fabric around it, which was considered to be a periphery and marginal in the creative work of fashion. But the reality is that in all these places, including Oslo, you had a lot of factories and you had a lot of producers who cater to a local clientele. So you had fashion designers in Oslo in the 18th, 19th century, and you had like fashion ready to wear that was, you know, exporting even abroad. So all these places, they are not super famous, especially at an international level, but they still existed and they were part of what people actually consumed. So I think it's interesting. No, I'm interested. I'm I'm not downplaying this. So I'm trying to think. So like, if I were to take my stupid foreigner, specifically my stupid American perspective on this, I would say leather, fur, felt, and then of course knitting would be the primary sort of mediums that I would probably find in in Norwegian fashion. Would that be about right? Yeah, I, I guess you could say that. And like, for instance, Paris haute couture imported a lot of Norwegian fur, for instance. So you, you definitely have a market of raw materials. That's for sure. But that doesn't mean that there weren't local creatives making use of these raw materials and others. And this is what this, all this history has been a bit lost and nobody knows about it. But I mean, like if you take fashion companies in France, well, they have access to lace and whatnot but they import a lot of it. So you had fashion companies in Norway which imported cotton from Manchester, for instance, made a shirt out of it and sold the shirt both on the national market and the international market. So you have all this... Fashion isn't really a fixed geographical market. It's, it's a global market no matter what. So you have these exchanges happening all the time. It's connected to the rest of the fashion system, in a sense. And that's what's interesting to me, at least. Yeah, it's fascinating. When you're saying that, I'm picturing fashion being made for Norwegians. So I'm not picturing a Norwegian fashion designer 
exporting to some other place. I'm thinking, what do the local people make for the local people? Yeah. I mean, you have definitely a local clientele, but you also have an export. Yeah, I mean, it's always an export business in a sense. So you also have clients which you don't really know about and are scattered around the world. So it's definitely part of it. All right. So last little bit, two questions I always ask everybody. So first one would be some three creative people that are sort of inspiring you or that you're sort of looking at yourself? I think one thing that was really inspiring or inspiring me was a series of very famous artists when I was in Paris, actually. And I was completely out of the art world at that time. And I was really mesmerized. So one of them is Michel Blasi from Toulouse, I think, originally, where I'm from. And he was doing this, you know, he was at the time having a puree of carrots and he was like using it to cover walls and that would be rotting, like literally rotting. And he would do that in luxury stores, for instance. So you have like the smell of rot and the visual of rot, which would be in a luxury store where you really don't expect it. So there was this little bit of craziness, which I thought, oh my God, contemporary art can be this. And maybe this is like something that in some way I would like to work with. Yeah, but Michel Blasi is like a very established artist. So, And so it was a series of, of, of people like that who inspired me. But now what I'm really more interested about, in a sense, is younger artists whose work I got to know by going to, to exhibitions in Oslo. And so I will cite two of them. <laughs> so that's three. Sandra Mojinga, who is really up-and-coming artist at the moment. She's using a lot of sci-fi references, and it's obviously something that is my generation, in a sense, or it's not my generation, it's super stupid to say that, but I guess a lot of us have sci-fi references. And the last one is Constanza Tenvik, or Constance Tenvik. I actually am pronouncing it in French now, <laughs> so it's probably wrong. <laughs> She's doing super exciting stuff, which is, you know, at a crossroad of material-based art and performance. And she's using also this little bit absurd humor, which is very enjoyable. All right. Last little bit that I'd like to touch on is from your experiences, any advice for the next generation? I would say uh, like for you, uh, probably like some things that you learned like now that you wish you had known before you sort of came out into the world? Yeah, well, you always, I mean, it's always possible to wish to know the rules of the game, especially when you come in as an outsider. It's obviously only through trial and error <laughs> that you learn how to do it. That is literally the, like, the, the mission of this podcast right there. Right. <laughs> yeah, I guess. And I guess everybody can relate to that as well. What I wish I had known is that I could just try. And I, not, I don't mean that as an abstract concept, but for the longest time, I thought I needed to be a certain type of person to do a certain type of work. And I don't consider myself a social person or I don't really have people skills that much, I guess you can say. And I thought like, if you wanted to be a curator, you needed to be well-connected and have a network and, you know, know how to make friends or this kind of very social related skills. And then I decided to go and try as I am with my personality, which is, you know, a lot of hard work, sometimes very useless work <laughs> for a long time. Just try and send and see what happens. And that was just like the moment when I realized that I could just try and it didn't have any consequences if I failed then it became actually a possibility. Yeah, when I was in high school, they gave a, the like aptitude tests for like jobs that would be good for your personality. <laughs> for me, I got a curator or a mortician. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, so, so the, the personality types of a curator is the same 
personality type is a mortician. So I think your need for social skills is Limited. not as strong as, as you think in the curatorial position if morticians are similar types of people. Maybe that's my, my next career choice, you know? <laughs> Who knows? When they invest time, money, their reputation on working with somebody else, when people decide to like work together with people, so whether it's a curator with an artist or a curator with an institution, whatever it is, like you're sort of staking your reputation on liking to work with those people. So part of it is, is that you not only have to be skilled and qualified at what you do, but people also want to enjoy working with you. Yeah. It's a part of the arts industry that people don't talk about very much. Like you, you have to be, you have to have a certain amount of people skills to a certain extent. I mean, because being a, be, like if you were a curator or a researcher and you literally just sat in a library or sat in your office and just did your stuff, nobody would ever see it. Nobody would ever read it. Nobody would ever experience it. So like you, there is a certain amount of getting out there that whether we're artists in our studio or researchers in the library, we do actually have to get out and sort of build our tribe and build a community of people who then will become our acolytes and our, our sort of uh, you know, people going out cheerleading for us as well. Yeah. I mean, what is pleasurable about it is that there is no template for it. And that makes it difficult to build collaborations that are fruitful and satisfying for different parts. But that also makes it less constrictive and actually allows for different personalities to get together. And I think that's a nice aspect of it. Oh, yeah. You brought up like the, your desire to have rules. I wish there were rules in the arts world in many ways. <laughs> but in many ways, the part of the thing I love about the arts world is that there are no rules. Yeah. I guess I'm a bit conflicted about rules myself. Like I think like to some extent there is creative merits to, to some rules. And there is a certain leeway in the way people can interact but at the same time, yeah, definitely sometimes knowing the rules of the game would help. <laughs> or that there would be rules. Yeah, to the I was game. gonna say you're assuming <laughs> there are some rules to the games, which there are not. Exactly. Sadly. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan mm -hmm. of a certain amount of structure in order to allow for a certain amount of absurdity. Because like if everything's absurd, then nothing's absurd. So like you need that comparative juxtaposition between some amount of structure and some amount of absurdity in the same way that you need some rules in order to know how to break the rules. Yeah, definitely. And there is also a set of accepted conventions to some extent. And like, for instance, when I, I, I mean, I came from academia, as I mentioned, and I was writing with academia framework in mind which is you give a lot of feedback to people and you receive a lot of feedback yourself and the more critical you are to the person the more you respect them and then I tried to apply that in the contemporary art world and it wasn't a success yeah they all say so, they want that yeah. but when you actually give it they think you're an arrogant little shit like they don't want that yeah it, then suddenly it becomes infringing upon some sort of artistic freedom i guess that's how it's perceived to an extent but in academia it's like the more the more you respect the person the more time you spend criticizing their text the more feedback you give them the, the more the better in a sense and then the person who receives the feedback is free to you know accept it or reject it there is no obligation to take on board what other people have said but it's some sort of thought exchange that happen that is very unique to academia that is not true in the rest of the world yeah i found out the hard way yeah i'm sure i found out the hard way you know 20 years ago and it's um uh, yeah academia is its own little ivory tower that has its own unique set of rules that of course we also don't know what those are either but yeah they're they're different than the rest of the art world in many ways yeah they are and it's not nothing of this i mean none of these rules are actually written or said or necessarily discussed so it's obviously internalized and then you you think you know and you try to apply it and it doesn't work so 
But also you can challenge them. Once you know they are there, you can actually bring up the topic and discuss it. Once you have actually made something that is considered a mistake, then you have an opportunity. I think. Uh, agreed. I, I run. I learned far more from the mistakes that I've made than from the successes I've had. And trust me, I've had lots of mistakes. So, yeah. <laughs> so you're a very wise fool. Uh, that's that's how I got the title. Yeah, even though I made up the title myself. So, but yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's hard. The the I wish there were these rules. Maybe that's a that's a, there. That's my ne that's your next research paper. The rules of the art world. Yeah, accepted and written no, rules the of the written art world. Rules of the art yeah. world. You're going to write the rules of the art world for us because there are too many unwritten rules. Like I mean, in, you know, like my wife, she works as an accountant. She goes into the office. There are literally written guidelines. You must dress this way. You must be here at this time. You must leave at this time. You can, you know, there's a field of play kind of thing of the, of the game that is the, the, her job, the art world. Yeah. People drink, they do drugs. They like, you know, they can do whatever they want as long as they get the job done and they do it on time. And in some professional manner, People kind of are pretty okay with whatever comes about. And that's a very odd job that we, we've we chosen to be in. Yeah. But now that you put it that way, I would argue that, I mean, I don't want rules. <laughs> Not when they're presented like that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the bureaucracy is just like, it's... Yeah, it's another hell. Well, you're French. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm sure you're very anti bureaucracy having it. been the, the hub of creation <laughs> of bureaucracy itself. I'm well versed in bureaucracy. <laughs> mm. I hope you are enjoying and learning from these conversations as much as I am. If you like the podcast, we would appreciate a five-star rating and a nice comment would be greatly appreciated as well. We'll even take a critical comment too. Please tell your friends to listen and subscribe also. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We are produced by 5014. I am your host, Matthew Doles. And for more information about the podcast and our guests, please visit our website at wisefoolpod.com. The Wise Fool is supported in part by an EEA grant from Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway in an effort to work together for a green, competitive, and inclusive Europe. We would also like to thank our partners, Hunt Kastner in Prague, Czech Republic, and Kunst Centrene i Norge, in Norway. Links to EEA grants and our partner organizations are available in the show notes or on our website wisefoolpod.com. Mm -hmm.